Now, if an investor wants to build a green net zero portfolio, what type of asset path selection? What should what should not make the cut? What what will be out of place in one? So let's find out from our uh, second panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina. Would you like to start the introductions? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the light, which I can't seem to <laughs> fix. Um, but yeah, it's great to be here. So my name is Katerina Lindmeyer. I work in the responsible investment team at Nest, um, which is a large um, DC master trust. And um, I work particularly on our climate change policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Katerina. Yes, it does look like you're having a bit of, uh, bit of help from above there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Julian. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm uh, Julian. Hi, I'm working at uh, Alliance Global Investors, uh, managing for uh, for six years now of uh, Alliance Rainbow Strategy. So a strategy dedicated to the Rainbow Plus. So uh, happy to uh, exchange on on the topic uh, today. Good. Thank, thank you, Julian. Good good to have us with you. Good to have us. Uh, Timothy. Hello everyone, Timothée Jolans, I work at Amundi. I oversee ESG business development as well as advocacy matters with all our investment platforms, as well as with all our uh, client units. Happy to be with you. Great news, yeah, and good to have you with us as always. And last but not least, of course, Louise. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, delighted to be here. Um, so I work with Federated Homies. I'm a global equity portfolio manager. Um, Federated Home is um, well known within the space of RI, particularly for stewardship um, and our kind of positioning on sustainable wealth creation as well. And uh, I've been quite involved in the ESG factor research and also kind of running some of our low carbon and ESG strategies as well. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Uh, Katerina, could we start with you, please? Could you just explain to us how Ness is building a net zero portfolio? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I mentioned in the introduction, so we are um, now a 20 billion um, defined contribution scheme and we actually invest exclusively with internal fund managers at the moment. And we have a multi-asset portfolio spanning um, all asset classes, really listed equities, um, corporate fixed income, sovereign debt, private markets as well. So um, last year in July, we published our first scheme-wide climate change policy and we made a net zero commitment and at the time and i think still now we were struggling a little bit with what a net zero portfolio actually looks like in terms of a um, multi-asset portfolio like we've got but we decided that we weren't going to let that delay us and wait for sort of methodologies to overcome some of the challenges. Um, so we started off with kind of doing a bit of an audit of our portfolio, looking at all the carbon footprints. Um, and we found very quickly that it was quite challenging um, to aggregate that all to a total portfolio level, um, but also that there were still lots, lots of gaps. Um, so in terms of how we're now approaching net zero at the moment is we're actually looking at it um, at the asset class level. Um, so we're looking at um, listed equities, for example, and what transition pathways look like, and then um, transitioning our portfolios in line with that. So we've now done that with our um, developed and emerging market listed equities, and we've also um, transitioned our investment grade fixed income fund, and are working on some of our other fixed income portfolios. Um, we are still working with industry groups like IGCC on sort of broader um, top-down target setting um, because we see that really as a, as a key sort of missing piece at the moment in their zero portfolios. Like, what does that look like in terms of the decarbonisation trajectory? Um, and yeah, I'm really keen to work with other peers on that because we think it's really a challenge that everyone's sort of grappling with. Thank you very much, Katerina. Thank you, uh, Louise. Speaking as a portfolio manager, what should a green portfolio look like? So I think, you know, really topical question. And uh, and again, you know, maybe referencing the other panel, it does depend a little bit on who you are and there are different perspectives. But with all the challenges around greenwash, um, it is obviously really topical. We think, you know, we get the question from our clients, definitely looking for experience in the area. So, you know, what the fund manager has done historically, how long they've been talking about 
green in, in climate change and how long they've been doing it because it isn't something that you can do overnight. You know, there's a lot of expertise that's been built up over the years. Um, so having that expertise within the corporate level allocated resource is one way of ensuring that, you know, when you're looking at a portfolio, that there's like good, solid research base behind it. On top of that, um, you know, really solid ESG integration. And that comes from having um, tools, good data, um, integrating ESG and particularly the environmental considerations at a stock level and at a portfolio level. So you can't have one without the other. Um, and so therefore it's really important to have that um, kind of two pronged approach. Um, and then finally, you need, as well as having the screening and you know some of the things that people have talked about in terms of maybe moving away from the carbon intensive assets, um, the stewardship, that kind of green impact is also really important. So yes, you can measure your carbon footprint. That's going to be based on data that companies have reported in the last year, maybe the previous year. You can look at green revenues, which we think is also really important. But the other thing that we all talk to our clients a lot about is that green impact. So those engagement conversations, how we're pushing companies to, to move further, move faster, um, science-based targets, TCFD reporting, and in that way, actually kind of really have a direct real world impact as well. So those are all things that I think for a green portfolio that you should look for, um, you know, when it comes to reporting that transparency will depend on the type of investor that you are, but certainly for our institutional clients, you know, really detailed um, information in terms of the research that we're doing and also case studies as well. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, and Julian, if you're only picking or looking at green stocks, that does limit your universe somewhat. So does that mean that investors pursuing um, this particular strategy can expect to earn lower returns? Well, um, this is this is uh, actually one one debate that we that we have heard quite a lot uh, on, uh, specifically referring to the to the green bond market, uh, not, not only because uh, of uh, a, a an investment universe that would be uh, reduced, but also because um, uh, investors can at some point be worried on the extent to which uh, investing in green uh, so green bond, but uh, broadly speaking, green, uh, green uh, stocks, let's say, uh, would generate uh, a lower return than, than we can expect on the market. What I can just provide here is what I'm seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, specifically on the green bond market, which is that actually um, we have heard a lot and we have seen uh, over the last month, I would say over the last 12 to 18 months, but indeed, uh, there can be for investors uh, what we call a greenium on green bond issuance, meaning that um, issuing a green bond could be at some point, even if it's not uh, uh, always the case, uh, but more and more importantly, uh, we, we can see issuers coming on the market and being able to issue a green bond at a more favorable cost than uh, they, would, uh, they would afford to if uh, issuing a standard bond. When I'm saying a more, more affordable cost, it's, let's say, three, five, uh, seven basis points, perhaps, uh, at maximum. But the point is that, on the other hand, uh, we also see that on the investor side, there is a so high level of demand that if we look at these green bonds on the secondary market, the performance is uh, actually aligned with what we see on the, uh, on the standard bond market. So. Perhaps it is indeed the case that uh, as an investor, you have to, uh, let's say, forego uh, a part of your, uh, your uh, investment return. But in terms of performance, this is, uh, this is really compensated, uh, meaning that in the end, you, you, you do not lose uh, anything on your investment compared to, uh, to, to a standard one. Thank, thank you very much. And, and Louise, um... What do you say to your clients when they say things like, okay, we're going down a green portfolio, a more sustainable portfolio, all very well, but does that mean I'm going to earn, I'm going to collect lower returns? So the simple answer is no. Um, you know, we've got some backup um, evidence. So we've created our own kind of proprietary scoring methodology. We've been doing that research um, for six, seven years now. Um, and, you know, we continue to see actually the positive attributes from um, ESG 
actually when it comes to the environmental metrics we haven't seen so much outperformance and you know we're very clear about that that actually at the moment we see the strongest returns from governance and the social factors the environmental factors doesn't hurt you but but it doesn't necessarily help you um, that's from the quantitative perspective so that's like the evidence um, that we can demonstrate to clients but then on top of that, we've also got the more kind of qualitative assessment and our expectations on, you know, where the market is going. And I think we can all agree, you know, climate change is becoming more of a material risk. We're definitely seeing that TCFD reporting being rolled out um, across um, sectors. And therefore, you know, as companies focus on it more, um, maybe we'll start to see more of the kind of positive returns also coming through rather than just the kind of the neutral impact that definitely in terms of, um, you know, that kind of portfolio construction, it can be done in such a way that um, you can get those greener outcomes um, while also not um, kind of losing performance, which I, which I think is really key and certainly some of the conversations that we used to have. Um, so in terms of kind of that lower return, absolutely not. Um, it does also depend on the type of strategy. Um, so if you are looking at a kind of best in class approach, taking into account kind of a broad sector exposure, um, then you're gonna get less volatility. If you're looking at a more concentrated portfolio that is very specifically tied to just a couple of green themes, um, you know, like renewable energy or batteries, then you're gonna see a lot of volatility in that because you know there'll be times when there's a lot of um, supply and therefore prices come down and everything like that. Whereas if you're looking more to kind of a broader, more diversified portfolio that isn't so much thematic, but just looks for good environmental practices. So, you know, good environmental management systems, um, good governance around some of the environmental challenges, then, then you're gonna be able to be a bit more balanced in terms of the outcomes that you receive. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Louise, thank you. Uh, Timothy, um, are there enough opportunities in fixed income to build a balanced portfolio of green stocks? Well, I think it has been said in the in the previous panel, uh, just focusing on, on green bonds, uh, there is a lot uh, already uh, out there to, to build a, a diversified portfolio. It's a, it's a one trillion plus market. We've passed that uh, landmark uh, last year, and there are no more more and more uh, diversified issue in terms of teams with uh, sustainable, sustainable bonds, social bonds, sustainability linked bonds. So the, the key when it comes to, to green bonds is that beyond the fact that it is an easy fit within a, a fixed income allocation, because it's cost effective, because it's a bond, because it's scalable, is, is really to, to focus on additionality. To, to make the demonstration progressively that your green bond portfolio will eventually actively contribute to the realization of your green objectives. So, so, so energy and, and ecological transition goals in, in, in general. So the key question to me is not anymore, uh, are there any uh, enough green bonds out there is more, is there enough additionality? And you have to look at pushing the boundaries in, in emerging markets, potentially in private debt, in securitization, and so on and so forth. The second uh, remark I would make is that if you want to contribute to real world decarbonization, you need to take into account the broad picture and indeed uh, active, actively engage uh, the issuer. To, to make sure that progressively there will be an alignment between its overall corporate strategy and the objectives which are stated in the in the green bond program that's that's also critical so building a, a green bond uh, portfolio in a meaningful way uh, requires to take those two two dimensions in, into account additionality of the program additionality in terms of overall uh, issuer commitments now, if you take the other approach, which is to build more aligned credit portfolio, not necessarily focused on, on the green bond part of the, of the market, here it's, again, it will depend a bit on the, on the methodology you, you adopt. If you want a portfolio which is already aligned, notably uh, based on, on SBTI targets uh, potentially taken by, by issuers, 
it represents roughly 14% of AA global credit universe. That's the reason why we believe uh, building transitioning portfolio makes sense. Uh, that was the, the approach that was adopted by uh, the European Commission with CTB and NPIB. But obviously for active managers, there are additional layers that one can, uh, can consider and that will add value to your portfolio construction process. Thank you very much, Jimmy. That's quite comprehensive. Uh, Julian, in your opinion, is the, is the opportunity, is the additionality of uh, the fixed income universe wide enough for building a, a green portfolio? Um, I would say that uh, as of today, uh, yeah, we can uh, build uh, a green portfolio, at least on the fixed income side and focusing on the, on the green bond uh, asset class or sub-asset class, uh, and having, <clears throat> I would say, a quite decent uh, level of uh, granularity and a relatively decent level of diversification. There is still uh, a way to go because uh, if we look at specifically at the corporate side of the market, uh, we have still uh, a quite heavy uh, representation of uh, financials and uh, utilities, let's say. These are the two main sectors represented. And compared to a standard uh, bond market, we are really overrepresented. But we see for, I would say, uh, one year now, one, one to two years now, we, we see a, a, a slow diversification, which is uh, which is coming. We have seen uh, so corporate issuers from uh, so in 2019 mainly from the telco sectors, but we have also seen uh, corporates from the chemical sectors, uh, even from the uh, from the metal and mining, namely the, in the in the uh, aluminium space. Um, it is. It will. It is likely to take still a bit more time to have a, a complete diversification. It is key uh, if we really want to transition the whole economy because it is not. Um, we, we cannot really uh, uh, have in mind that uh, if we really want to, to transition the whole economy on uh, on. Uh, pathway aligned to the, to the goal of the Paris Agreement, it's not, uh, it will not be by only investing in uh, renewable or only investing uh, in a green building, for instance. There, will, there is really a need to have the whole uh, industrial sector to, uh, to also align its, uh, its business model on the, on the objective of the Paris Agreement. So it, it is really uh, a need to, to have the, the whole economy and all sectors uh, being active in their transition, whether it is by the, by the green uh, by issuing green bond or not, uh, but um, but it is uh, um, a move that we are slowly seeing on the on the market. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, and Katerina, um, when it comes to green assets, I mean, how does Nest approach investing in listed stocks as compared to private stocks, for example? Is there a difference? Yeah, there is, um, I think, mainly by virtue of mostly having limited data in private markets. So um, in listed stocks, so we actually, our equity allocation is in passive funds. Um, so our approach is to use tilts, um, looking at um, pathways for specific sector and then how all companies are um, positioned for, for that decarbonisation pathway. Um, in listed markets, we've also got quite an extensive engagement program um, that's partly done by our managers, and we also do some engagement ourselves. And um, there's just the focus on listed markets really is just improving um, on the data sets we use, improving the methodologies, updating it when there's new information that comes out, such as the new IEA scenarios. Um, and trying to also get more forward-looking data on, on risks, which um, particularly on physical risks is, is a bit challenging. Um, but in private markets, it's, it's quite different. Um, so one advantage is that they're generally um, smaller portfolios, so we've got a better idea of what is in there. Um, but yeah, the data is, is really challenging. So for example, we're working with our um, private debt manager in particular, um, we weren't really able to get any information on SME loans in our portfolio and um, working with our manager in terms of what they can do um, when originating those loans in terms of um, 
getting increasing disclosures and also um, how they can hold um, those issues to account, for example, through ESG questionnaires and, and so on. But I think there's also in private markets um, quite interesting opportunities. So I think Louise mentioned solutions earlier on. Um, so obviously there's solutions in listed market as well, but you don't get the same sort of um, companies that are really, really doing, you know, just renewables, for example. So, I mean, there's, there's utilities that have got a large allocation to, to renewables, but um, a lot of them still have legacy coal as well. And so um, for us, we've recently invested in a private equity infrastructure um, with Octopus in a um, pure renewables mandate, which is really exciting because that means we can actually directly invest in climate solutions. We're still looking at also mapping our equities portfolio um, to, to see what the kind of breakdown is between green solutions and, and other things. But um, I think, again, as Louise mentioned at the start, that's also quite challenging in terms of um, making sure there's no greenwashing and sort of having a common definition of what a green asset actually is. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Timothy, uh, same question to you, really. I mean, how are you approach? Is there a difference in how you approach uh, listed stocks as compared to private stocks in the, in the green sphere? Well, you, you could really distinguish uh, private assets in general uh, beyond stocks. That would be true as well for real estate, for private debt, and, and so on and so forth, and, and the world of, of listed assets. And, and it's true that, generally speaking, uh, data availability is an issue. Uh, and, and, and for very simple data, like, like CO2 emissions, for instance, it's still uh, an issue to, to get access to, to relevant uh, data for certain uh, investment universities. So we can improve, uh, I think, that, that state of the market uh, collectively uh, acting as, as JP, uh, really uh, engaging our industry companies. And asset owners on the other side can really engage actively their JP so that we get access to ESG data for private asset portfolio. That's uh, really something that we can, we can sort out collectively. Now, uh, specifically to real assets, uh, it will also depend on whether you focus on aligning your portfolio or supporting a green transition. Uh, for portfolio alignment, uh, I must say it's still a, a challenge. Uh, maybe we can leave aside the real estate market where we have more and more data, but for other assets, clearly data availability will be an issue. Now, when it comes to building a solution that contribute actively to uh, climate uh, resolution and ecological transition. Here we, I mean, methodologies are available and, and you can build really uh, robust uh, data points and indicators. So we are ready there. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Moving into the last five minutes or so now. Uh, Louise, are heavy emitting industries, so-called dirty industries, are they no-no for a green portfolio? So, I mean, I think it's been referenced a little bit um, historically that, um, or early in the call, that maybe historically it would have been harder to, to rule out some of these. I think now actually um, we have more transition names that are available to us. We're seeing more companies um, that do have plans. So um, kind of as active investors, actually, we can take on board some of the newer frameworks, some of the latest information and act on that. Um, that's something that if you're in a passive product, if you're following a rules-based um, approach, maybe you have to be a bit more cautious, um, whereas we can really get on board with companies' transition plans. And therefore, it means that maybe our investable opportunities is a little bit broader and we can benefit from actually kind of being part of that transition, um, which, is, which is really important. Um, when it does come to the companies that are still invested in, you know, certain like gas, for instance, um, that is kind of part of the transition, but, you know, not part of the net zero, then um, we look for really good governance. We look for really good um, disclosure around the risk. You know, that that just makes sense for us as investors. We, we deem it to be a really material risk. Therefore, we're asking more of those companies. We're looking for a better payoff for that. Um, and again, as I mentioned at the start, in terms of that portfolio approach, that's also really important. So if it's less than 5% of our portfolio, but it helps us achieve you know, the long-term outcomes of the product, 
um, you know, the, we're going to take that into account. But at the same time, we also want to be transparent about what we're doing within the product. Um, and certainly there are some products where we will draw a clear line and say, you know, this is what we won't invest in, um, you know, and that might include energy companies, might include utility companies. But then we also have some products which are more part of the transition and therefore we can hold companies maybe if they still have 20 percent exposure to um kind of fossil fuel power generation for instance but we can see that they're moving forward um so we try not to put the red lines around it and i think as active investors we we can benefit from doing that thank thank you very much for that louise and that uh, louise. katarina perhaps you could tell us um will green portfolios in your opinion will they become standard for institutional investors going forward will green be to go to yeah so actually our approach really is that um because climate change is such a systemic risk it should really be integrated in all portfolios it shouldn't just be that um, you get esg portfolios um which you pay a premium for but that um this is something that becomes part of um, overall risk management so actually our preference is, is not for there to be separate portfolios um, that, you know, for us as an asset owner, we can add one green portfolio and we can have an option for our members to opt into. And um, that's that box tick. But really that we make sure um, that these considerations are integrated in all investment decisions. And I think that's really um, what we're focusing on at the moment. Um, I think there was a question in the Q&A as well around asset allocation. Um, at the moment, we haven't made any kind of changes to our asset allocation, but we're trying to um, integrate more climate consideration into, for example, our capital market assumptions and sort of looking at over the long term where um, potentially transition risks or physical risks could have bigger impact in certain regions than others, um, certain asset classes or sub-asset classes. And yeah, just make sure it goes across the entire um, investment decision making process. Thank you very much, Katerina. Uh, we're almost at time now, so the final point of, of this particular panel goes to Julian. Um, Katerina just said there, they won't be going forward, there probably won't be separate green and traditional portfolios going forward. Is that the way you see it? It will be part of the of the standard uh, asset allocation and standard uh, investments for mainly for tourism. I think the first one being that um, we, we have uh, we, we see more and more uh, uh, regulation coming also on the for for uh, for asset owners, uh, meaning that they do not only uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, nice to have to uh, to integrate the uh, ESG on their on their end. It's really a must have because there are regulatory requirements which are coming uh, and which enforce them to do to do this. But probably the most important uh, reason why it will be definitely part of the core asset allocation and the core investment decision process is also in terms of risk because uh, as uh, it has been already said uh, uh, earlier climate change is uh, not only uh, an issue that we have to cope with but also a risk and uh, uh, is also likely to materialize in terms of investment return and investment risk and it definitely needs to uh, to to be taken into account also uh, from uh, a fiduciary duty standpoint. So uh, it, it is uh, it's really key for, for institutional investors going forward. Fascinating discussion. I'm sure this will continue to discuss this going forward in the coming years and to see if some of the, the trends you, you've, you've touched on there will emerge. So thank you very much to Katerina, to Julian, to Timothy and Louise. Thank you very much, guys.